So thank you, and so let me go on and introduce our speaker. So um, Dr. Yesko uh, never aspired to be a politician. Uh, he was always very happy just to stay a scientist. Um, but in 1999, immediately after he received his PhD in physics from Princeton University, uh, he was offered a fellowship um, through the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, and, and this fellowship meant that he could go work for a congressional office in Congress, uh, first with a congressman, and later on he moved on to the office of a senator. And uh, yes, right, the, 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 the congressman was Ed Markey from Massachusetts, the senator was Harry Reid from Nevada. And um, so it was Senator Reid who uh, decided to nominate him as a commissioner to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and, and he served there from 2005 to 2012, and was the chairman of that commission from 2009 to 2012. His personal story that he has recounted in his book, Confessions of a Rogue Nuclear Regulator, uh, is far more about what happens when a, a scientist is thrown into the Washington political cauldron, and how he, how he managed this experience and why he went rogue. Uh, his involvement included working with the Japanese regulators after the Fukushima disaster. Um, uh, and currently, he is serving as an adjunct professor in, at Georgetown and Princeton University and is an entrepreneur involved in, a, in clean energy companies. Uh, after reading his book, which was given to me by uh, Roberta Pabir to read, uh, I, I was fascinated by his experience and I contacted him and we exchanged our thoughts and ideas as a fellow fellow physicist uh, and someone who is now active in politics. Uh, and this contact led me to invite him to come to New Hampshire to speak to the Science, Technology, Energy Committee and any other group that's interested in hearing his story. And um, I'm glad that he decided to do that. Um, so he's going to speak about his experience and also about his views on uh, the future of nuclear energy, uh, the safety issues surrounding nuclear energy, and the future of our own country in the way of energy efficiency and, and the energy future. So I'm, I'm more than I'm very glad to introduce and welcome uh, Dr. Gregory Yachko uh, as your speaker. Thank you, um, Peter, for that introduction, and thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, it really is a tremendous opportunity for me to talk to you all. Although I have to say, you know, my impression was that that SAPA was a reputable um, environmental organization. <laughs> if I reputable, I would have thought that you had a president who had been arrested and would have been proud of that arrest and would not have gone and tried to get that arrest overturned. <laughs> so I'm a little bit disappointed to hear that Peru did that. Um, <laughs> because I think that takes you down a notch. I think you should have stuck with that arrest and kind of kept it on your record and, and, and held it up proudly. So, um, but I will nonetheless still give my call. Um, uh, there are plenty here who do have that arrest. Well, there you think. <laughs> so that, that, we're good then. I think I can, I can think. I have to admit, I've never been arrested. Um, at least not for anything like that. Um, uh, but uh, it's a real pleasure to talk to you. I want to talk a little bit about some general policy things, a little bit about my personal story, um, and then kind of how my views evolved. And, uh, and I'll try and be brief. I've been doing this for a couple of days now, and I seem to keep, keep getting longer each time, but I'll try and make tonight free since it's a little bit late. But uh, I want to start uh, with a picture, which I think is a tremendous, this is a just dramatic picture. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, um, this is why we're still here in a certain sense, is because of things like this. This is an image from California, um, from the very significant wildfires that, uh, that happened in California. Uh, it's very clear now um, that the occurrence of wildfires is increasing largely as a result of the, the occurrence and the severity, the frequency and severity of these catastrophic wildfires is increasing because of climate change. So it's, it's altering in California in particular, the rainfall patterns, um, and that is causing greater drought, then you have conditions that are leading to these fires, and they're, and they're tremendous. Well, 
without this specter of climate change, we would probably not be talking about nuclear power anymore. It simply, it simply would be a technology that would be going away. Uh, however, there are a number of people um, who continue to believe that nuclear power is crucial to dealing with climate change. Uh, here's a quote, this is from 2018. Nuclear is ideal for dealing with climate change because it is the only carbon-free, scalable energy source that's available 24 hours a day. The problems with today's reactors, such as the risk of accidents, can be solved through innovation. It was Bill Gates in 2018. I have another quote. Nuclear will make the difference between the world missing crucial climate targets or achieving them. That's Jim Hansen in 2015. And for those who don't know Jim Hansen, is he is essentially the, the father of climate change. So, two very, very powerful voices, and they're not the only voices saying this. And it is really only because of this that the nuclear industry has any legs left um, today. And these statements are just simply wrong. Um, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about why I think that, um, what makes me credible in saying that, uh, and you know how I evolved to the point where I was comfortable saying that. Because, you know, there was a time when this kind of image and this kind of concern always tempered my concerns with nuclear power, concerns that I saw up close and personal. Um, but as, over, particularly over the last 10 years really, things have happened dramatically that have changed the energy markets to the point where we no longer need nuclear power. In fact, not, long, not, long, no, not only do we not need it, but in fact it's really almost an anti-solution to climate change. Um, and so that's that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, tonight, and told largely through um, just the story of how I got onto the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and some of the things that I saw. Um, so I'll, I'll read a little bit from my book, not too much, um, but um, but I think a good place to start uh, is how I started. And Peter gave you a little bit of the kind of nuts and bolts, but I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of the story of the first time I met Senator Harry Reid. I had never planned to be in a position to tell this story. A trained physicist of Birkenstock wearing PhD, still amazed that a few simple equations could explain. I have to admit, I kept my Birkenstocks until I got married. My wife told me I had to get rid of them. <laughs> um, we're still married, but it's not it's still a source of um, A Birkenstock wearing PhD, still amazed that a few simple equations could explain something as extraordinary as the Northern Lights. I never intended to become a nuclear reg regulator. Before I came to Washington, I had never heard of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. There are no television shows or movies with dashing federal agents rushing into nuclear power plant with blue blazers flashing NRC logos. But because of a powerful politician and a right place at the right time kind of timing, I became not only a nuclear regulator, but ultimately the head of the agency. And this is how my first conversation with Harry Reid, the second most powerful Democrat in the Senate at the time, who eventually got me on the commission, went back in 2001 when I was interviewing for a job in his office. As we sat down in his office, he said in a soft, raspy voice, I would like you to come work for me. Great, I replied. You're a physicist, right? Yes. Tell me the name of your PhD dissertation. Very proud to say this. An effective theory of baryons and mesons. He stood up abruptly and asked, pointing out the window, what do you think of my view? Um, that, that was a typical exchange with Senator Reid. He was somewhat abrupt and got to the point and then moved on very quickly, especially when it came to things like nuclear power and nuclear technology. Um, so I worked for Senator Reid for a number of years. In particular, I worked on the Yucca Mountain Nuclear uh, Waste Repository that was planned for um, Nevada, which ultimately um, kind of came back during my time at the NRC and ultimately ended under President Obama. Um, before that, as Peter said, I had worked for Congressman Ed Markey, uh, then uh, or, or now Senator, then Congressman Ed Markey, and he was very involved with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission because of his, um, his concerns about nuclear power, much of which started because when he was first elected, his district was within the 10-mile EPC or near the 10-mile, but I believe it was within the 10-mile emergency planning zone in Massachusetts. So that was how I kind of got familiar with the NRC, was through Ed Markey and then um, much more extensively through, um, through Senator Reid. So eventually Senator Reid did get me onto the commission, and then eventually he was instrumental in, in having me become uh, the chairman of, of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And that was a process, it was not a simple process because I was viewed generally by the industry skeptically and with concern. And in fact, the industry had such a hold on the agency that there had never been a commissioner 
in recent, really in a decade or more, that had gotten onto the commission, if they in any way, shape, or form had views that could be considered antithetical to the industry. Um, and by no stretch of the imagination was that my position. I had worked for people who had very strong views about the, the industry. Senator Reid was very much against the nuclear waste repository. Uh, Congressman Markey was very much concerned about safety of nuclear power plants. I personally had no views in general about nuclear power. I was a physicist. I thought it was interesting technology. Um, and I, you could best describe me in a way as agnostic about nuclear. I never really thought about it because I didn't really have a reason to think about it. Um, so I did join the commission. I served on the commission as a commissioner for four, four years, four and a half years. And then in 2009, when President Obama was elected uh, president, um, I was given the opportunity or had the opportunity to become chairman. Uh, the way the NRC works, it's a five-member commission. Each commissioner is presidentially appointed, Senate confirmed. Uh, at the time, there were only, well, there were four commissioners on the commission, and as often seemed to be the case, there were three Republicans, and I was the lone Democrat because of the way the math and the years had worked out. So I was the logical choice to be named chairman um, by President uh, Obama. And that took a little bit of doing. Uh, there was a campaign uh, that was going on to keep me from being named chairman. Um, my predecessor chairman had worked heavily with a number of uh, pro-industry groups to lobby the administration. Uh, and at the time, the Obama administration was really had two priorities. The one priority was climate change, the other priority was health care, um, and then you know, economic priorities and, and things of that nature. Um, so it brings us back to this issue of climate change, and they were very much convinced that nuclear was key to climate change. So they were hearing from industry organizations, they were hearing from labor organizations that, um, that I was bad choice because I would put a stop to what at that time was the so-called uh, nuclear renaissance which was a, a period in which the industry believed that they could, for the first time um, in decades, license and then build new nuclear reactors. And that is the backdrop, really, then, to the story of how I became chairman and, and the things that I experienced and dealt with as chairman. So I will read you a story. Um, some of you have heard this, because you know, some of you have um, seen me talk at other places. But um, and I, I will warn you, there are bad words in <laughs> uh, they're not my words, but they are bad words. Um, so, I talked to President Obama and said, look, I really want, uh, I want you to make Greg chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, and for him, it was a parochial political issue. Yucca Mountain was still a prominent issue. He wanted somebody who he believed he could trust on that issue. And I had worked for him. I knew the issue very well. And he thought I would be sympathetic to his views. I will say, despite what most people believe, he never once talked to me about Yucca Mountain. Well, he asked me once about the status of Yucca Mountain, but otherwise he never once talked to me about it. He never once told me what to do. And in fact, before I became chairman, I was in his office in a reporter call. And he was talking to the reporter, and I was listening in on the other line, and the reporter said, so you know, what does Greg think about nuclear power? What is he going to do? And Senator Reid said, I have no idea. I've never really talked to him about nuclear power, and I haven't told him what to do. But I just trust him, and I think he'll make the right decision. And that, in fact, was all he ever told me, um, despite what lots of people believe um, over the years. But eventually, he did um, convince President Obama to nominate me and to make me chairman. Um, and Senator he called me and told me and said, but you need to go talk to Rahm Emanuel. Um, he wants to talk to you before you, you actually start. And um, that's where the dirty words come from. That's where the dirty words come from. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so I'll just read you a little bit about how that encounter went. And it starts, uh, I went into his office. He wasn't there. We actually met in, in uh, his deputy's office, a guy named Jim Messina, who wound up then, uh, among other things, running um, uh, President Obama's second uh, campaign as his campaign manager. I sat across from Jim. My excitement at the opportunity to demonstrate I was ready for the challenge of leading the NRC, causing me to ramble on about arcane safe, nuclear safety statistics. Jim spoke a bit about the President's priorities around health care and climate change as we continued to wait for Rom. Suddenly, Rom appeared. When I stood to shake his hand, he looked me in the eye, then sat in a small chair against the wall. His body so tense, it was as if he might jump up at any moment and bolt from the room. As he was seated to my right, I was in the uncomfortable position of sitting, of sitting sideways to him. I could either look at Rom and ignore Jim or look at Jim and disrespect Rom. 
it was clear Rom knew what he was doing in picking that seat, taking every opportunity to make me feel Ill, Ill at ease. I decided I'd look straight, and I'd looked straight at him. For the next few minutes, my gaze never left his face. And this is what he said. You are a fucking asshole and nobody likes you, he declared. If we make you chairman, everyone at the NRC is going to quit. No one wants you to be there. I'm only telling you what no one else will tell you. This was not the opening I had anticipated. All I could think was, I guess I won't be telling my parents about this meeting. Which was true, but of course they asked me, they said, how'd it go? I said, it went great, Mom. Um, and then I said, I, or he said, and then continued, I personally don't care about nuclear power. But the president wants to address climate change, and he needs to have nuclear power as part of that program. So he needs the NRC to do its job, and I don't think you could do the job. So again, what, what you have to understand is what he was saying is, look, the licensing of the reactors is crucial, and you need to make sure that that is done well. He wasn't saying you need to license them, but he was saying that process needs to work. You shouldn't just arbitrarily stop, which even if I wanted to, I could not have done. Just as I was about to declare my full support for all the president's priorities, he cut me off. Don't think this is just coming from me. I spoke with the president this morning and he asked me again, why am I going to make this guy chairman when no one wants him to be chairman? I said to the president, because Harry Reid is the best Senate majority leader there is and Senator Reid wants him to be chairman. So the president is going to do this for Harry Reid. I took a breath. Apparently the president either did not agree that we needed tough nuclear safety regulations or didn't think I was capable of doing the job. When I entered the White House that day, I had expected to leave proud of my new opportunity. Now I was just hoping the snipers on the White House grounds wouldn't take aim at me as I left. <laughs> so that was that was my awakening to what it meant to be chairman of the nuclear regulatory commission. This was a job, in particular, at that time, that had significant um, ramifications in Washington. There had never been, well, I should say there had never, there had not been for over a decade, or really almost 15 years, a chairman who anyone could have considered to be uh, even marginally um, critical of the industry. And, you know, I certainly was not a fan, uh, was not a, uh, a beloved by all the environmental organizations in Washington. Um, they certainly didn't despise me, but I was not exactly seen, based on the, the work that I did as commissioner, as somebody who was an anti-nuclear person or anything to that effect. But the industry's hold on the commission had been so strong, and here they had lost, in a very public way, a very, very significant fight which was to get somebody else to be chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So I went into this job with the cards stacked very much against me. Um, and things only got worse um, as time went on. And really one of the reasons and one of the changes that happened um, had to do with uh, what happened in Japan thousands of miles away. I started in 2009 uh, as chairman, the primary issue in terms of public awareness or in terms of focus for the agency was really this issue of new reactor licensing. The industry was at the height of what it called the nuclear renaissance. And at that time, they were proposing about 30 new reactors um, in 18 applications in front of the NRC. So that was a major, major piece of work. Now, we were only going to de deal with that in small chunks. Um, and part of that was because of the information I would get when I talked to people on Wall Street. And they would tell me, we intend to finance about four to six new reactors because we have a history in this country of the nuclear industry promising to build reactors and failing to do it on time and on budget, and often with very, very significant cost overruns. So Wall Street was very skeptical. But something was happening at that time that made the industry feel like it was safe to try again. And what was happening at the time was that gas prices, natural gas prices, were starting to go up. This was before fracking had become a very common occurrence and it introduced really a flood of cheap natural gas into the electricity market. So at that time they were looking at natural gas as really, or the industry or general electricity industry was looking at natural gas as a preferred energy technology. But of course, natural gas is very sensitive to the price of natural gas. It's dominated by the fuel price. And the price of natural gas was going up and it was going up to the point where nuclear power plants, which historically had been expensive, were now economically competitive again. And so the industry began in the early 2000s to really push this idea of new nuclear reactors. So that was the background and the context for my time as chairman of the NRC. And here you had one of the most um, agnostic, really, commissioners or chairman of the agency that had existed for a long time. Uh, so 
that was the situation, and so I went about my job doing things the best that I could and, and trying to focus on safety, a number of important safety issues, fire protection was one that I focused on a lot, and a number of other things. And I had generally kept that same view of nuclear technology. It was a technology that needed to be regulated, the regulator needed to be effective and strong and tough, and that was important. Um, those things changed in 2011, in March of 11. And I'll read you what happened on that day as, as I remember it. Deep under the ocean of, off the coast of Japan, two of the plates that make up the surface of the earth were grinding and pressing against each other like sumo wrestlers locked in a tussle. Unknown to the operators at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant 100 miles away, one of these plates let go of its grip. As one piece of the Earth's crust slid over the top of the other, seismic monitors at stations across the globe came to life. Their electronic needles bouncing up and down, tracing out the pattern of a gigantic magnitude 9 earthquake. It was the largest ever recorded in Japan and one of the largest ever recorded in the world. Yet it was not the worst problem about to crash down on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear station. The upheaval of the ocean floor that caused the earthquake also sent walls of water nearly 50 feet high hurtling towards the beach outside the Fukushima plant. The tsunami lifted large boats and carried them miles inland. It swept away homes and businesses and people, leaving behind nothing but fields. Tens of thousands were killed. Despite the tsunami's thunderous arrival, the nuclear accident would progress only slowly and silently over the days after the waves battered the fortified shell around the reactors at the plant. The nuclear reactors would be disabled from the inside like a body affected by a swift but a small but swiftly growing tumor. By the time disaster had run its course, over 100,000 people had been forced from their homes. Many of them will never be able to return. The Japanese economy collapsed, and the government eventually halted operations at all of the nearly 60 nuclear reactors in Japan. So here you had not a, not a calculation, not a scenario. You had a real accident affecting real people. And looking back, one of the unique features of this accident, and one of the things that I remember so vividly, is how long it took. There were very significant milestones as the accident was progressing. Uh, many of you may have seen these on television, large explosions sending material hundreds of feet up into the air caused by hydrogen accumulating in the reactor. <coughs> that first hydrogen explosion happened about a day or so after the reactor uh, accident began. Several days later, more hydrogen explosions occurred. And it was almost inconceivable in the nuclear safety world that a nuclear accident would go on for more than 24 hours. In fact, all the incidents we train around, and in fact, the computer models that were used only made projections up to 24 hours, because the view and expectation was by that point, everything would be under control. Well, we were still really dealing with this accident as in an uncontrolled way, at least for two weeks. And it was a major round-the-clock operation for the NRC for months. So this was very different than everything that we had trained, that we had looked at and studied from our models. Things were happening that weren't supposed to happen. And I heard that refrain from many staff as they would walk around the NRC talking to people, responding, and trying to make sense of what was going on in Japan. So this was a very significant accident. There were many different stories that happened that occurred during this. Read about many of them in the book. But what was important for me, I had a responsibility as the head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Once the focus, the immediate focus turned from Japan, which we were very heavily involved in Japan for a couple of reasons. Number one, Japan was a huge ally of the United States for strategic reasons. And secondly, there's a huge US presence in Japan. Military forces and many businesses and um, other citizens live there. So the US was very concerned about those Americans. So we played a very prominent role working very closely with the Japanese government to deal with this response. And we're really very closely aligned and very closely um, uh, working with them throughout. But one of the things that I had to do was go in front of the American people and reassure them about what was happening with American plants. And at that point, in the early days, we didn't know very much. We knew generally what was going on. We knew it was bad. We knew it was getting worse. We knew there had been a big tsunami and there had been a big earthquake. And we had lost all electrical power to the site. And we knew that when that happened, that invariably you were going to get an accident. But what we thought was it was almost impossible to not be able to recover from that kind of a situation. 
And in fact, that's what we were seeing in Japan, was that it was very difficult to recover, more difficult than we thought. But at that time, we didn't have much more to say other than the plants in the US were safe as we knew them. But what I said was, they were safe, but we were going to study what happened. And if we found things that needed to be changed or needed to be improved, we would do that. And in fact, while I was saying that, so I find it an interesting story. I'll be giving a, he happened to be on the West Coast, I think it was in the West Coast of the US, he was doing a visit somewhere, and it was right around the time of the accident, he made a public statement and he said, I've ordered the NRC to investigate the accident. And I quickly got on the phone when I heard it, talked to the White House, and I said, you understand that we are an independent regulatory agency. The president cannot order us to do anything. And unlike the current administration, the staff quickly said, oh, we're sorry, we'll fix that. And, um, and they did. And then the president changed his rhetoric and said, we would like to see the NRC. We hope the NRC will consider doing something like this. The effect was largely the same. But I'll be honest, we didn't need the president to tell us we needed to look at it. That was pretty obvious. Uh, so one of the things that we did almost immediately, about a week after the accident started, was we kicked off a task force that had 90 days to look at the accident and come up with recommendations about what should be done. Uh, the result of that study and those recommendations showed me more about the nuclear industry that started to really add to this growing pile of evidence that something wasn't quite right with this technology. First, we had this accident for which things that weren't supposed to happen were happening left and right. And then we had the clear need to look at reforms, look at, at ways that U.S. plants could learn from this, because this was a U.S. design reactor, U.S. technology. So there were similar plants here in the United States. So what should we learn to make plants less likely to have an accident like that here? So this group put together a task force. And they did in 90 days what we asked them to do, which was come up with a series of recommendations. And what they found was that generally they believed the plants were not immediately in, in unsafe, but that there were things that needed to change. There were a list of 12 recommendations that they came up with that they believed we should implement to make all U.S. nuclear power plants safer. Well, as soon as that report came out, the opposition began almost immediately. Uh, much of it, and most of it, I'm quite frankly coming from my colleagues <coughs> on the commission. Um, I talked to one of my colleagues, uh, then Commissioner Postolakis, who said to me, shaking his head, they did too much. There was an expectation among the commissioners, <coughs> among the industry, the big task force was going to look at this issue and come back and say, don't worry, everything's fine. Well, that's not what they did. They came back and they said, we need to fix things. So as the chairman of the agency, I felt it was my responsibility to do everything I could to support them and to make sure that those recommendations were adopted. And I'll just give you a, a brief account of some of the opposition that I ran into. So the industry certainly, once this report was out there, they began their communications blitz. And to counter those efforts, I began a communication blitz to publicize the report as it had been written. I put on a straightforward challenge. We should review the findings in 90 days, just as the task force had developed them in 90 days. Then the industry should adopt all the approved recommendations within five years. A seemingly long time, but near light speed considering the industry's history and the agency's history. The industry likewise acted quickly to mobilize opponents of the report. While they never engaged me directly, I learned of their efforts through secondhand conversations, most memorably with Congressman Fred Upton, the chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, one of the most powerful panels in the House of Representatives and the Oversight Committee for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the House. Just before I was scheduled to appear on PBS uh, News Hour to cap off my media blitz, a genial man who insisted everyone call him Fred, Congressman Upton had demonstrated over the years a willingness to discuss serious issues even though he shared a few of my political beliefs. Guiding him through the contents of the report, I tried to show how moderate and sensible it was. It was clear, however, that he had been given a very different interpretation of it. And Upton wanted me to know he saw the NRC chairman's role as that of a moderating figure in the agency's proceedings, at best working to soften the staff's positions. And this is what I said to him. I asked the people to write this report, I told him. It's my job to talk about it, defend it, and pursue it. Who else is supposed to do that if not for me? And you know, this is one of those moments where I just had this realization. Here I was the chairman, and he was telling me, just soften it. 
maybe you can say it's a, it's a recommendation from the staff. It's, it's something the agency is going to look at and consider. And all I could think was, well, why did I ask these people to do that if I was going to tell them that? Why did I make them go public with a report? They certainly weren't allowed, I mean, not allowed, but they weren't in a position to go talk about it on the news. I was the spokesperson for the agency. That was my job. So if I wasn't going to talk about it, who was going to talk about it? There was no one else. No one from within the agency that wrote this report. And these were not, I did not go out and handpick a group of people within the agency who I knew were going to write the most critical report. These were all the people that if I had pulled anyone in the agency would have said, these are the best people we have. These are reasonable people. They're smart. They know what they're talking about. And they came up with this report. And they did a really good job in 90 days. They analyzed the accident. They came up with a set of 12 recommendations, which today are really the only things that, in a way, you, that are in the realm of things you could do that are reasonable to do. <coughs> Sadly, most of those recommendations have not been implemented to this, to this day. So you know, here you have kind of in this milestone of my evolution of thinking about nuclear power. You have this accident, which kind of shatters this myth of nuclear as this hypothetical problem. A hypothetical computer simulation that shows you could get some amount of radiation release. Well, here we had a nuclear accident that was releasing radiation well beyond the, the 10 mile EPZ that you have here around Seabrook. We, in fact, recommended that Americans stay over 50 miles away. And I was criticized for that decision because people thought I had told the staff we need to stay 50 miles away. But in fact, what had happened was the staff told me we need to be 50 miles away. And I said, okay, that's what we're going to do. So, we had this kind of this knocking down of these pillars of, of the myth of nuclear power. And then we had real recommendations, moderate recommendations, sensible changes that could make nuclear power plants safe in the light of one of the most significant nuclear accidents in the world, and one of, if not the most significant accident involving US-based technology. And the, and the result, the opposition was, don't do anything. Push back, stop, fight. Now, if you go back to the beginning, and I told you that the biggest issue that was in front of me was new reactor licensing, well, that was still going on. So at the same time that I'm dealing with this accident and trying to get the agency focused on reforms, the pressure was still there to move forward on new reactor licensing. And in fact, we barely paused at all in the effort to do new reactor licensing. So the accident happened in March of 2011. Uh, the task force report came out 90 days later in July of 2011. The commission made an agreement to act on some of the recommendations by that fall in September. Well, at that same time in September, we were having very significant hearings to deal with the nuclear power, the nuclear power licensing activities. So, you know, here we were dealing with these twin, almost antithetical ideas, dealing with a major nuclear crisis and reforms and licensing new reactors. There were either, in my mind, two options. One was to pause what we were doing with the new reactor licensing, or to tie these two items together in some way. Namely, to ensure that if we move forward with the new reactor licensing, that we would ensure that those new plants would adopt and include whatever reforms we were going to make for the existing reactors, whatever came out of this set of recommendations. And that was something that I fought for. Um, unfortunately, I got no support for my colleagues on the commission, uh, and I was faced with a choice. Now, I, I will tell you, and you can read all about this in the book, in, in the interim, in December of 2011, I happened to be invited to a congressional hearing um, to hear about what a bad person I was. Um, this was also another one of these opportunities um, when uh, I told my mom and my dad not to watch the hearing, and they did, um, and I was not happy about that. Um, Needless to say, I was accused of a lot of different things, including being a criminal and not something as simple as trespassing, um, but some kind of felony. Um, and I was also accused of being abusive to women, um, which, you know, to this day is something I, I don't know how to respond to because there is no way you can respond to that. Um, but that, that had happened in December of, of 2011. So, I was not in the mood for any kind of public disagreement with my commission colleagues. Uh, that had been a difficult experience to go through such a public um, session, and uh, the last thing I needed was on the issue that, for most people in the Washington establishment, was the most important issue involving the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, namely 
the licensing of new reactors. So in February, March of 2012, just a few months after, um, I was faced with a choice. I was getting no support from my colleagues about this idea of joining the Fukushima actions to the new reactor licensing, and so I had a choice. I could either support the licensing and kind of go along to get along, quite frankly, um, or I could uh, I could oppose those new reactor licenses. And I will say that I was very much in favor of going along to get along at that point. Um, but I was very fortunate that I had uh, a number of people working for me who had more courage than I did. And they told me, and I'll read just a little bit from here. It was my staff who ultimately convinced me, throwing back at me words I often said to them, if we don't do this, then who will? If I would not, not say that we cannot license new reactors without acknowledging that Fukushima happened, who would? Once again, I was in this position of being faced with this choice. If, if I didn't say it, there was no one else who would. And there were people outside the agency, but from within the agency, whose job it was to protect the public. If I wouldn't say it, I couldn't rely on somebody else to say it. That was my job. So weeks later, in February of 2012, when the commission formally voted on the new reactor license for the Georgia plant, I led the commission meeting as chairman, cast my vote in opposition, and gave the simplest explanation I have ever offered for a dissenting vote. There are significant safety enhancements that have already been recommended as a result of learning the lessons from Fukushima, and there's still more work ahead of us. Knowing this, I cannot support issuing this license as if Fukushima had never happened. But without this license condition, in my view, that is what we are doing. As ever, the money, power, and promise of a new generation of nuclear reactors were too enticing for common sense to prevail. And with about a year to go in my term as chairman, I began to ponder my future outside the agency. The time to leave would come sooner than I knew. And I'll leave you to read about how that happened. So that was in many ways the culmination of all of this in my thinking. And after that accident and recognizing that we weren't going to make reforms, it became clear to me that the idea of nuclear power needed to change. We should not have emergency planning zones around nuclear power plants because we should not have nuclear power plants that can emit radiation outside the plant in a way that can cause harm to people. That is ultimately the standard we should have for safety for nuclear reactors. Unfortunately, almost no large-scale commercial nuclear power plants in the world can meet a standard like that. And for years, we've tried to convince the public, we've tried to convince ourselves that it's okay. And then an accident like Fukushima happens, and it's not okay to the people in Japan. It's not okay to the economy of Japan, which suffered economy-wide, the country, as a result of that accident. It's not okay to the people in Germany who were forced then to transition their electricity sector in a way that they weren't necessarily prepared for. So these accidents have global ramifications and global consequences. And this is from three nuclear power plants, four nuclear power plants. This is not something we should get from a nuclear power plant, from any kind of energy source that generates electricity. These things can happen from natural disasters, but they shouldn't be happening from things that are just there to make sure we can turn the lights on. So needless to say, um, I left the NRC, watched from a distance what was happening, in particular with those new reactors, and um, I'll put up this number right here. Um, in hindsight, that decision that I made is looking better and better by the day. Um, of those four reactors that were licensed, two of them have already been canceled. Uh, they were canceled after uh, several years because they were tens of billions of dollars over what well, one was going to be tens of billions of dollars over budget, and so they canceled it for two reactors. The other project continues um, to be built. This is, I actually just need to update this slide. It's now 28 billion. Um, this is the cost for two new reactors uh, that were licensed and kind of forced through at a time when we should have been more focused on safety. And those reactors today are costing $28 billion. And if you remember, when I started this talk, I talked about those conversations with people on Wall Street. And what they told me was, and they don't care. They don't care about nuclear power or not. They care about money. And they said, if they can't build these on time and on budget, there's never going to be another nuclear power plant built in this country. And that is where we are today. No one will build nuclear reactors when it costs $28 billion, which is more than twice what they projected it was cost. And they're still not finished. And they're running at least five years behind schedule. So the, cost, the time for construction is about 10 years, at least. So when I go back to the quotes from Jim Hansen, 
and I hear him say nuclear will make the difference between the world missing crucial climate targets or achieving them, I don't know what he means. We cannot build four nuclear reactors in this country in five years. We can build, we can start four and maybe build two in ten years. That is not going to solve any climate change issues that we have anywhere. Uh, that is simply a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for failing to solve climate change. Um, if we look at what's happening with the rest of the nuclear industry, you see here, this is a chart that shows the blue line represents all the nuclear power plants in this country if they were just to operate until their existing or their initial 40-year license. As you know, the NRC created a process to allow additional license extensions for nuclear reactors, which pushed the effective life of the reactors to this line right here. This blue represents the fact that a number of reactors have actually already shut down. Um, and this is actually not number of reactors, it's total energy from reactors, but it's, just, it's a proxy for that. So we are right about here on this green line. And what you see is over the next, basically the next 20 years, almost all the reactors in this country are going to close if nothing else is done. The only way that they'll survive is if you give them another 20 year extension. But today, if you ask the industry, the industry put on a poll and they, and they actually put out this poll as a positive sign and they said, we have half of the nuclear reactors in this country are considering a second life extension. Well, you really need to look at that as half of the plants aren't even considering it. So half of these plants are not going to go out to here. So that means, in at best, we're going to have about this much out to here. But that's not even going to happen, because almost all of these plants are not even going to make it probably here. I mean, what you're going to see is pretty soon reactors will start shutting down more quickly than this green line is. Because the fundamental reason is that nuclear power is no longer economically competitive. Nuclear power now is some of the most expensive carbon-free electricity that we have uh, in this country. And that is what has fundamentally freed me to be able to finally say that I don't really support nuclear power. Because as much as I went through these experiences and realized that the industry had too much influence at the regulator and that the technology was more hazardous and that I in many ways had been led to believe, I was always tempered by the reality that climate change is a far worse problem. Climate change is a global existential problem. And while nuclear accidents could be significant, they weren't on the same scale. And that always tempered my views. And then I began to learn and realize that there are alternatives. And not only are there alternatives, but they're actually cheaper. And this is, this is a, I know this is difficult to read, um, probably from where you are, but this is a, an analysis of essentially the relative cost of electricity from a variety of different sources. And uh, what you see in the top here, it's important to probably focus on this. Um, and this is produced, this is a, a, a financial analysis firm, Lazards. They do a lot of analysis for Wall Street firms, for investment bankers, for different people in the financial community. And this is a numbers they put out every year. Um, and you look right here. You can't really read the numbers. This is uh, 36, this is 40, and it's essentially uh, $40 a megawatt hour, which you can translate into cents per kilowatt hour. So it's four cents a kilowatt hour. This is for um, solar PV utility scale solar. Down here, you've got another uh, type of um, solar PV at 36 cents. Down here, you've got wind energy at anywhere from 29 to um, $44 a megawatt. So 2.9 cents a kilowatt hour, 4.4 .4 cents a kilowatt. So this is for new generation. So this means building and then operating these plants. You can do them today in sub four cents a kilowatt hour. Down here are the costs of fossil fuels, new fossil fuels. So gas is your closest competitor down here to 41 to 74, or four cents to seven cents a kilowatt hour. More expensive than the cheapest wind and more expensive than solar PV utility scale. And more importantly, gas will fluctuate. Gas will fluctuate based on the price. Right now it's low because fracking has provided a lot of very, very cheap natural gas. That could change. The fracking industry could change. People may find that they no longer can operate wells with prices at that point. Wells will shut down prices will go up. 
and then the cost of a gas power plant will go up. The prices of these things never really changes because the fuel is free. So not only is this competitive with this, but it's not subject to the same future price volatilities that gas plants could, could lead to. Now, you've got here coal, which clearly coal, nobody's building new coal plants, coal's too expensive. Can't compete with gas, nor with uh, wind and solar. A uh, nuclear, this number is meaningless. The closest comparison for it would be these plants under construction. But at this point, the, the numbers are just off the chart. Nobody really knows how much those plants are going to cost. But they're nowhere close to any of these things. It's probably over here somewhere, if they ever get finished. So what you're really competing against is you'll see this kind of diamond right here. This is the marginal cost for, for nuclear. So these are the best performing nuclear reactors. On average, you know, the industry costs about three cents a kilowatt hour to run a nuclear power plant today. That price will only go up as the plants get older. Uh, these things are still getting cheaper, and these things are getting cheaper. So nuclear is getting less and less economically competitive. And that, in fact, is what we're going to see more and more. And that's why nuclear is phasing out, and it will phase out, and there's not much that we have to do about that. It will just happen. It'll happen in this country, and it's happening over the rest of the world. So you know, that is, in a way, the closure to my story is these facts are an example of good public policy. This is not an accident that these prices have come down. They came down because of programs that were intended to stimulate the technologies, and then the market took over and made it even better and, and accelerated that cost decrease faster than anyone could have predicted. And that is, in fact, where we are today, where now the right alternatives are the cheapest alternatives. And you know, as, as an environmentalist, that's not usually where you are. Right? You're usually arguing for the things that are more expensive, but they're better. Well, here, you don't have to make that argument. All you have to do is show that they're cheaper. And so going forward, that is what we're going to see. And as I said, it's given me the freedom to say now that these issues of safety, of proliferation, of spent fuel, they're not worth it anymore. And we don't need to make this trade-off between climate change and nuclear power. We can solve climate change, and in fact, we can only solve climate change by turning away from nuclear power. So with that, I thank you and look forward to you. Yeah. Yeah. Two minutes. Seven minutes? OK. Right. Do those figures factor in the cost of maintenance for wind Yes, yeah, so this is, these are essentially, it's an average life cost. So this is a metric that's used in the finance community. It's, it's a proxy for effectively how much you'd have to charge or how much it would cost to generate electricity from these sources. So for wind and solar, for instance, the costs are primarily construction costs, some operation and maintenance, but no fuel costs. For things like natural gas, it's largely driven by the cost of natural gas. Um, so it tries to incorporate all those things and give you a way to compare what are really apples and oranges to compare them in a common way. Uh, now, obviously, you do need to do replacement, but one of the one of the things that's important, for instance, wind. Um, there's been a big program. We're now getting to second generation wind. So there's been a big program to do what's called wind repowering, which is you take the existing structures, you put new machines on them, new turbines, you make them more efficient, and you then recycle and continue to reuse those those existing turbines. Um, but you would then eventually have to do replacement of some of these technologies for sure. Uh, but anything you do has some life cycle and some need for replacement eventually. But again, with solar and wind, you know, part of what you see for pricing in these things is also based on legacy systems that were much more expensive and less efficient than the ones you have today. So as you begin to put in newer and newer generations of these technologies, your prices come down even more. <coughs> So I have two questions. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for what you've done to shed light on the situation. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so I, Peter uh, is working on some, uh, trying to get some money for real-time monitoring. Mm -hmm. I've been an advocate for it through my legislation mm -hmm. that I tried to get through and we're still trying to get through. What that is based on is the concern that during, now you talk about accidents, mm -hmm. but do, through regular maintenance activities, exposures happen in these communities that you say should not be living mm -hmm. around these plants. Um, and I know there have been studies on health effects in Europe that 
uh, have happened, but I wanted to know your opinion of that here. So that's my first question. Mm -hmm. And then my second question is, um, you really talked about how much pressure you were under in your position. This is the same thing uh, that happened with the EPA, with the um, FDA, with the USDA. What can we do in a larger um, <laughs> perspective? Like, how can we stop the influence that just creates problems like this that are public health hazards um, and threaten us all? So that's too small. Too small yeah, well, questions. Well, on, the, on the first question, so um, you know, the issue of monitoring. Um, you know, I'm a scientist by training. Data is always a good thing. I don't ever think data is a bad thing. And I, I once had a conversation with an with a industry utility executive, I don't remember which plant it was, and I said to them, you know, you do report to the NRC on a periodic basis, effluent releases, because plants do release radiation. Right. Controlled releases that you know, sometimes become uncontrolled releases, but, um, <coughs> but they do release radiation to the environment that is below what are believed to be actionable levels from a safety perspective. And then I said to this plant that nuclear power plant safety is based on a study that was done in the 90s by the National Cancer Institute um, and looked at radiation around nuclear power plants and kind of gave us the correlation of what the health effects are. That study is widely on date. It's not very good anymore. And so actually when I was chairman, I helped get started a new study to update that. Uh, we asked the National Academy of Sciences to, to do it, and they did. They started it, and then just a year or two ago, the NRC killed the study. Um, you know, and again, to me, and, and the reason was the industry doesn't want to know, because they don't want, there will most likely be situations, and if you did a comprehensive study of cancer incidents around nuclear power plants, you will most likely find power plants that have cancer clusters around them, if you look. So they didn't want that because it was too difficult to try and explain that that's probably not coming from the plant because the radiation releases are not large enough <coughs> based on everything we know to cause a significant cancer cluster. But those clusters would exist and you likely find them because cancer clusters do happen just statistically. And it would be very hard to show one way or another whether that's caused from the nuclear power plants they built the study. And, you know, that's to me just wrong. I mean, we're supposed to be a science-based agency that's focused on information. We can handle tough information. We're, we're big kids, you know. And, um, but that's what the agency did. I, I, to be honest, I was surprised I got as far as I did. <laughs> it never got stopped. But, you know, a couple of years after I left, they, they didn't mind doing that. Um, on the question of what can you do, you know, it, there are great people at the NRC who need good leadership. And the issue comes down to leadership. And I, I'm not to say that I was a good leader. I was, you know, I was kind of a speak your mind leader. A lot of people said I was a bad leader, and that's fair, you know. But but you need you need good leadership, and you don't have it. You don't have leadership that is public health and safety focused. You have leadership that is primarily industry protection focused. I wouldn't say industry supported, but industry protected. And that has been the case for a long time. And it is that way because the industry is, has influence with senators. The senators are influential in the confirmation process for commissioners, and that's what happens. They get to the NRC, they set the tone. You know, people who are there for decades, they start out, they're well-meaning, and then they see the decisions the commission makes. And when they make recommendations to the commission, they start realizing at a certain point, well, why am I making recommendations to the commission? The commission's going to reject. So I'm better off making recommendations that the commission's going to accept. And of course, once you do that, you start you start to lose your kind of your your vision, and that's what happens. And that's you know you imagine after 20 years, then what you start to think now now you no longer have a staff telling you things that may be inconsistent with what you want to hear, and that's never a good thing. And it's not intentional; it's just human nature. Um, and and that's a lot of what you know what I saw. And um, and. The way you change it is politically. You know, you got to let more people who care about these issues, who care about having a commission that is focused on public health and safety. That's that's the way you do it. Thanks. Uh, wonderful presentation. Really informative. Can't wait to read the book. Uh, my understanding about nuclear power is it's the only generate. Those are the only generating plants in this country that cannot buy their own liability insurance to cover. 
damages for a major malfunction. Is that still the case? Can you talk about how that changes the calculus here regarding the cost to the public of nuclear power? Because as I understand it, the U.S. taxpayer foots the bill for the uh, catastrophic insurance uh, fund for the nuclear industry. Can you, can, you, can you talk a little bit about how that affects the calculus here? Yeah, well, I'll talk a little bit about the program. It's not quite the way you've described it. Um, Please help me out with that. Yeah, so what happened, this occurred years and years ago when the industry was starting. They had a problem, right? Nobody knew how to write insurance, and no carrier was going to write insurance for a technology that could cause potentially catastrophic um, accidents. And more importantly, they had no data, so they had no way to price premiums. So the government stepped in and said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to indemnify the reactors up to a certain amount. And they initially set an indemnification level as the technology advanced, then modified that to make it larger. But it basically works in two ways. Um, every power plant is required to um, purchase commercial insurance coverage for third-party liability in the event of a nuclear accident. Um, right now, those policies cover on the range of a couple hundred million dollars. So then on top of that, they layered on what they call a secondary premium, which is in the event of an accident, every nuclear reactor in the country has to contribute money to a secondary premium. That amount then provides, and there's a fixed amount that each plant has to contribute. And that figure was set and then indexed for inflation. Um, that amount then represents the, indemnif the indemnification limit now, which is approximately 20 some billion dollars. But one of the interesting features of that, uh, which, you know, you look at the Fukushima accident, you're talking liability, third party liability, probably in the hundreds of billions of dollars. So under the price Anderson Act, which is the law that was established, when you go above this, well, the law says, well, then Congress will step in. Well, you know, that's kind of a stupid law because Congress can't really write a law to tell Congress to step in. Congress probably will step in or they won't step in. Um, but most likely what would happen is people wouldn't get paid or Congress would come up with some money or something. Um, but what's interesting about this particular provision, and is a really overlooked phenomenon, is that the secondary insurance pool is not a fixed amount that then each reactor has to proportionally contribute to. It is a cumulative amount that each reactor is required to contribute a fixed amount to. That was kind of a convoluted way of saying, as you get fewer reactors, the number goes down. So it's not a fixed value that as you get fewer reactors, each reactor has to pay more. Actually, what happens is, as you get fewer reactors, that indemnification limit actually goes down. Now, nobody ever thought of this because nobody ever thought about kind of the end of the industry. They thought, well, this is a great idea, and it's not a bad system. I mean, quite frankly, for catastrophic insurance coverage, it's a good system. You can argue about whether you know the values are set correctly. But it's not a bad thing, you know, it's not a bad way to, to share risk.